breaking laws from people from Jesus Christ to Nelson Mandela, from Rosa Parks to Martin Luther King. Laws have always been broken to facilitate substantive change. Today's speaker holds a BA in journalism from Oakland University and a radio broadcasting degree from Spex Howard School of Broadcast Arts. Gary Yarofsky has already experienced more than many people will ever want to in a lifetime. He's been arrested more than 10 times and spent 77 days at a maximum security detention center, all in the name of animal rights. Gary has lectured in hundreds of schools nationwide, including the University of Connecticut, Michigan State, and Bowling Green. Author Charlotte Montgomery even included a chapter about Gary in her book, Blood Relations. Please welcome PETA's national lecturer, Gary Yarofsky. Aren't humans amazing animals? They kill all kinds of wildlife by the million, deer and birds, coyotes, all kinds of cats, groundhogs and beavers. We terrorize and kill these animals by the million to protect domestic animals and the feed of domestic animals. Well, then humans enslave, terrorize, and kill domestic animals by the billion cows, pigs, chickens, and turkeys. We terrorize and kill these animals by the billion and eat them. Well, this in turn kills humans by the million because eating animal flesh causes fatal and degenerative health conditions like heart disease, kidney disease, and many cancers. So then humans enslave, terrorize, and kill millions of other animals to search for treatments for these illnesses, which, by the way, will never work because animal research is unscientific. Go by the book Sacred Cows and Golden Geese by Dr. Ray Greek. Elsewhere, millions of humans are dying of hunger and malnutrition because the food they could eat, like corn and wheat, is being used to feed the animals that most people eat instead of feeding every starving person, not only in the U.S., but abroad. And finally, many people are dying of sadness at the absurdity of humans who kill so easily and terrorize so violently, yet once a year, I think in December, we all send out cards praying for peace on Earth. Good evening, my name is Gary Yarofsky. In 1996, I founded ADAPT, which became Michigan's most outspoken and radical animal rights organization. In 2002, I became the official orator of PETA, people for the ethical treatment of animals. Because of my Michigan ties, many Midwestern law enforcement agencies, government officials, media people, and politicians know me as the most outspoken and radical activist, not only in the state of Michigan, but in the entire Midwest. I have been arrested 13 times for random acts of kindness and compassion following in the footsteps of other routine radical lawbreakers like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Mohandas Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, and Jesus. Please do not misconstrue what I am saying. I do not think I am King, nor Gandhi, nor Mandela, nor Jesus. But I am following in their routine radical lawbreaking footsteps. In 1997, I liberated 1,542 mink from an animal concentration camp in Canada euphemistically referred to as a fur farm. Subsequently, I received a six-month sentence in maximum security, where I spent 77 days there before being deported back to Michigan. Once a liberator, and now an educator. Before I talk about the vegan ethic, I need to let everyone know that I did not come here today to be your enemy. I came here to educate and enlighten, tell you things you're not supposed to be told, and show you things you are never supposed to see. If you want to make me your enemy today, hey, that's fine. Join the club. I have thousands of enemies nationwide. Heck, I can even put you in contact with some of them if you'd like. Today's speech is intended to uplift you morally. Now, before we continue, I need to show you seven minutes of graphic video about the vicious traditions of animal abuse that still exist in our society. I am not showing this video to shock you, though you will be shocked. I'm showing this video to let you know that I never engage in exaggeration when I'm describing the disgusting rituals of human to animal slavery. Let me also mention this. For some reason, crying has become a taboo in our society. But if you feel the need to cry while you're watching this video, crying is the proper emotion to exhibit while you're watching an atrocity take place. If you feel the need to laugh during this video, you might want to consult with a good psychotherapist. You're about to witness the killing of a perfectly healthy puppy. 
Every year, U.S. shelters execute 10 million perfectly healthy puppies, kittens, dogs, and cats simply because nobody wants them. But you can stop this senseless killing in three easy ways. Have a vet spay or neuter your dog or cat today. Never buy an animal from a breeder or a pet shop and adopt your next dog or cat from a city shelter. Financial assistance is available. Please go to this website or call us today. There is nothing but blood trails, misery, slavery, and murder behind the propaganda spread by the fur industry spin doctors. The fur trade is truly a death trade. In the name of vanity and greed, every year 40 million animals have the fur ripped off their bodies in a disgusting display of inhumanity. Manual neck breakings, mass gassings, and anal and genital electrocutions are the standard killing techniques used on every animal murdered for profit. Baby seals are clubbed to death in a violent annual carnage, while the vicious steel jaw leg hole trap kills millions of free-roaming animals like coyotes, raccoons, foxes, and beavers. If companies insist on selling misery, boycott them at once and tell them that the blood is on their hands. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. This is injustice. Go to this website or call us today. Behind closed doors, every year, millions of monkeys, dogs, cats, rabbits, and mice are injured, tortured, and killed in unscientific research experiments. Outrageous lies from the National Institutes of Health and emotional ploys from other animal researchers only mislead you about this inhuman practice. Does this sound like science that could benefit your well-being? Please help us stop this insanity. Go to this website or call us today. The circus meets every definition of slavery. Animals chained and caged and forced to perform unnatural tricks against their will. Animals bought, rented, and sold, and shipped around like cargo in boxcars and semis, while someone else profits off their labor and from their misery. Humanitarian Dick Gregory once proclaimed, When I look at animals held captive by circuses, I think of slavery. Animals and circuses represent domination and oppression. They wear the same chains and shackles. All circuses use violence to train elephants, lions, bears, and tigers, and the training sessions are comprised of beatings with hooks, iron bars, whips, and sticks. Fear is the only way to make these wild animals submit and perform. Most circus animals also develop neurotic behaviors. Elephants sway from side to side, lions and tigers pace, and bears rock back and forth in their tiny cages. Please extend some freedom to those who have none. Go to this website or call us today.
German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer once said that all truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. And third, it is accepted as being self-evident. Unfortunately, the hatred, and I mean hatred, that humans have towards non-human animals is so vicious, vile, and powerful, animal rights has not yet reached Schopenhauer's third stage of common sense. The human intellect remains so remedial and self-absorbed, the notion of animal rights is usually mocked or ignored. But I think it's high time that humans climb down off their make-believe pyramids of domination and extend some simple decency, some simple decency to our planetary companions. Before this discussion continues, I need to let everyone know that I am not an animal lover. Do not refer to me as an animal lover. This might shock you, but I do not love animals. Oh, I have the utmost empathy for their plight. But you cannot refer to me as an animal lover. I fight for animal liberation and peace because I loathe injustice and despise the way humans mistreat the animal kingdom. I spend less than 1% of my time watching Animal Planet, National Geographic, or Discovery Channel. Sharing the mating habits of the blue-footed booby does not make the world a nicer place. Only veganism can do that, which is why I am vegan. Vegan means I do not eat anything that had a face, a mother, or a bowel movement. Vegan also means I do not consume any product that was derived from anything that had a face, a mother, or a bowel movement. If you're still consuming food that once went to the bathroom, that once defecated and urinated, you might want to change your diet, repeat its veggie starter kit, and go vegan. Vegan also means I do not wear any animal skins, obviously fur, but that includes leather, wool, silk, and down. Pay less, $15.99. Fake leather. Let me mention this about leather. You know, most people find it morally reprehensible for people to wear fur, yet those same people don't find it morally reprehensible for people to wear leather. But besides size, shape, and color, there is no inherent difference between a cow and a mink or a cow and a fox. Cow skin is mink skin is fox skin. Cows feel the same amount of pain as mink and foxes, and a cow wants to keep her skin attached to her body as much as a fox wants to keep hers. So you must condemn both fur and leather. Condemning one and not the other would be hypocritical. Of all the exploited beings on the face of the earth, animals are the most violated. That's why I'm here today, to ask you to join millions of others in a remarkable crusade against oppression. But before anyone decides to engage in this compassionate crusade, understand there is one important stipulation that you must adhere to. All of your prejudices must be extinguished. There is no room for any racism, sexism, heterosexism, or, of course, speciesism, which might be a new word to most people today. Speciesism, the unfounded, unethical, and unprincipled view that the human animal has every right to mistreat, exploit, and murder the non-human animal. 
And just like the previous isms, speciesism lacks coherent thought and is a narrow-minded view of the life that comprises this planet. Nobel Prize winner Isaac Bashevis Singer, who escaped Nazi-occupied Poland and lost family members in concentration camps, once called speciesism the purest form of racism. 2,600 years ago, the great philosopher Pythagoras said this about speciesism. As long as humans continue to be the ruthless destroyer of other beings, we will never know health or peace. For as long as people massacre animals, they will kill each other. Indeed, those who sow the seed of murder and pain will never reap joy or love. Now, after studying those statements and others, I now understand that speciesism is the root of all hatred, of all violence, of all discrimination that exists on this planet. And we will never destroy the branches of hatred like racism, sexism, and heterosexism unless we destroy violence and hatred and bloodthirstiness at its root. And that root is speciesism. The first form of hatred that human beings are taught is to eat the animal. Translation, mistreat the animal. Translation, hate the animal. Translation, view the animal as an inanimate object and a mere commodity. Before anyone is ever taught to hate or discriminate against a gay person, they are taught to hate and discriminate against animals. Before anyone is ever taught to hate or discriminate against a certain race or ethnicity, they are taught to hate and discriminate against animals. Before any man is ever taught to mistreat a woman, he is taught to mistreat an animal. Did you know that each person who chooses to eat animal flesh is responsible for the murder of 3,000 land animals throughout their lifetime. Whether you kill thousands in 78 years or 78 minutes, you are still a killer and a terrorist. I did not come here today to try and convince you that animals are more important than human beings because the issue of importance is irrelevant to how animals should be treated. No one in this movement has ever said that a mouse is more important than your mother, your father, your sister, or your brother, because we don't make up arbitrary lists of who's important. And we don't care about anyone else's arbitrary list of who's more important. We care about peace and justice. The Mahatma, Mohandas Gandhi, once said this, I do not regard flesh food as necessary to us. I hold flesh food to be unsuited to our species. The life of a lamb is no less precious than that of a human being. I should be unwilling to take the life of a lamb for the sake of the human body. The more helpless the creature is, the more it is entitled to protection from humans, from the cruelty of humans. Gandhi was just one of many luminaries throughout history who adopted the animal rights lifestyle. He was a true humanitarian who opened up his circle of compassion to include animals, not exclude them. Other people throughout history who adopted the animal rights lifestyle and practiced vegetarianism and veganism. Pythagoras, Plato, Socrates, Einstein, George Bernard Shaw, Schweitzer, Harry Beecher Stowe, Percy Shelley, Tolstoy, Da Vinci, and Cesar Chavez, just to name a few. Around six years ago, when I fully embraced the peaceful philosophy of animal rights, and understood that animals had an inherent right to be free and live completely unfettered by human dominance, I wondered why it took me more than 20 years to attain this non-violent awakening. I asked myself, who taught me that animals were put on this earth for food? Who taught me to disrespect animals and view them as mere commodities? Who stole my compassion, my empathy, and my conscience? Who lied to me? Who instilled that vicious mindset of human-to-animal exploitation as standard operating procedure? Each and every person in this room should ask those same questions. Think deeply about that. Who taught that violence to you? Who told you that animals should be your food, your clothing, your entertainment, and your research specimens? Who lied to you? Who took your compassion, your empathy, and your conscience? Who gave you the belief system that embraces the misery and murder of innocent animals? Is it your parents, your friends, your institutions of learning, your government? your religion, I'm sure you'll find, just like I did, that it was one or more of those aforementioned entities who taught you and me to believe endless lies, or they too have been lied to, or they will benefit from those lies. I'm asking everyone to reevaluate your belief system. Ask yourself, why is this violence being permitted? For what reasons? And I hope you'll have the same revelation that I did.
the nonviolence through veganism, nonviolence through animal liberation, is the only ethical and acceptable way to live on this planet. Let's begin a formal discussion on veganism. And don't forget, after the talk, check out GoVeg.com. GoVeg.com. Last year in the U.S. alone, 10 billion cows, pigs, chickens, turkeys, and other animals were raised in concentration camps, euphemistically referred to as factory farms. They were sent to slaughterhouses where knife-wielding carnivores hang them upside down, slit their throats, drain their blood, and dismembered their bodies. Then because most people have acquired a taste for animal flesh, I stress, acquired a taste for animal flesh, their dismembered bodies were cooked and eaten. Did you know that sows, female pigs, are forced to live their entire lives and give birth in gestation crates and farrowing stalls? These prisons are so tiny, a simple task like turning around is a fantasy to a female pig. Now this intense confinement slowly drives her insane, and she ends up exhibiting neurotic behaviors like bar biting, where she bites the metal bars that confine her all day long. She bites these bars. In the slightly larger areas where the male pigs, the hogs, are kept, other neurotic behaviors occur. Fighting is common because of overcrowding. And when pigs fight, they've been known to attack each other's tails. So how does the pig industry solve the fighting problem? Two ways. One, ignore the situation. Two, vicious intervention. First. Pigs have their tails chopped off without anesthetic. Then, in a depraved attempt to reduce the effects of industry-induced aggression, pigs have up to eight teeth chopped off down to the gum line with a pair of wire cutter-like devices. And finally, to top off the barbarity, their testicles are ripped out as well. Oh, in order to mark them, to keep track of them, they have holes punched in their ears. It's called ear notch. Could you imagine being hated so vehemently that someone would rip out portions of your ear or castrate you or cut your teeth off down to the gum line, all without anesthetic? Did you know that the Animal Welfare Act of the 1960s, which happens to be a pathetic piece of legislation, kind of like our Constitution when it was first created, which left out many more humans than it ever let in originally, the Animal Welfare Act unequivocally allows people to torture, enslave, terrorize, and murder all animals, even endangered ones, if you apply for the proper permit. The Animal Welfare Act is a how-to guide to animal exploitation. Torture them this way, don't torture them that way, enslave them like this, don't enslave them like that, and kill them this way, don't kill them that way. Circuses, slaughterhouses, and research labs love to say, hey Gary, Hey, PETA, leave us alone. We're in complete compliance with the Animal Welfare Act. Well, my dear friends, you'd have to be a vicious idiot not to be in compliance with the Animal Welfare Act. Once again, since the basis of the AWA is torture, terror, and murder, how could an animal exploiter not be in compliance? The AWA's mandate for food and water does not ease the terror nor stop the murder. Smithfield the number one killer of pigs in the world, generates $8 billion every year by killing 1,100 pigs every hour. In fact, Smithfield's five biggest concentration camps kill 78,000 pigs every day. Do you know what government agency is in charge of enforcing the AWA? The U.S. Department of Agriculture, the same agency that oversees the murder of 10 billion land animals. Seem a little incongruous? Why don't we put pedophiles in charge of child protection laws, misogynists in charge of domestic abuse laws, and hunters in charge of wildlife management? My bad. We do that one already. A little sidebar for you. Every single state and national wildlife agency is run solely by hunters and hunt supporters. Period. Point blank. There are no animal rights humanitarians on these committees. You know how the hunting community always claims that Killing animals is sound scientific wildlife management. If that were the case, then how come in every single newspaper in the USA, hunting stories are always placed in the sports section, not the science section? Of the 10 billion land animals killed for food, chickens represent 9 billion, with another 250 million enslaved on egg farms. 
Now, raised in huge buildings, these factory farm warehouses enslave anywhere from 5,000 to 80,000 birds in one building. 18 by 20 inch battery cages for the egg laying hens, while the chickens, the males, are strewn about in a chaotic free fall. The tiny battery cages are a staple of the egg industry, where 5 to 11 birds share one cage. But inside or outside of the cage, these places of horror deny natural behaviors to chickens and hens, like dust bathing, preening, and happily roaming freely, something we all take for granted. For the record, hens prefer more space than 18 by 20 inches, and chickens do not like to live in groups larger than 30. Therefore, fighting is common in the chicken and egg industries. How do they treat the fighting problem? Two ways. One, ignore the situation. Two, vicious intervention. Chickens and hens are de-beaked, meaning the sensitive portion, top two-thirds of the beak, is seared off with a red-hot blade heated to 800 degrees Celsius. Egg-laying hens are shot off with so many antibiotics, they're forced to lay up to 300 eggs every year. Because of this, their uteruses have been known to bleed and protrude from their bodies. And when hens can't keep up with the demands of the egg industry, they don't go to sanctuaries, people. They're sent to slaughterhouses and killed. Let's not forget that egg farms have to breed birds, so there's always a fresh supply of hens to lay eggs. But upon hatching, if those babies turn out to be males in the egg industry, they're considered useless to the egg industry because they don't lay eggs. Only females can do that. So male babies are put in plastic bags, suffocated, tossed in the trash, or they're thrown into huge rendering machines where their live bodies are ground up and used as feed. Bottom line, whether it's an egg-laying hen, a factory farm chicken, a free-range chicken, or an organically raised chicken, they all end up dead from unnatural causes because people have acquired a taste for animal flesh. Comedian Dennis Miller, who was not an activist, one sarcastically, yet truthfully, made this statement about free-range chicken farms. Free-range chickens, they all end up dead. Don't seem that free to me. Don't be duped by the free-range industry. Cows, turkeys, ducks, sheep, and other animals are subjected to the same barbaric treatment. Bulls are castrated because cows are artificially inseminated. In fact, nearly every male animal is considered expendable because nowadays just about every animal raised and killed for food on this planet is artificially inseminated and genetically engineered. Now, in case you don't believe me, I'm sure everybody read the latest edition of Pork. Everybody got their latest edition of Pork in the mail, right? Right along with Sports Illustrated, Newsweek, Cosmopolitan, Pork, Big Industry Trade Journal. If you flip around the pages of Pork, you'll find an advertisement for Geneta Pork. Better pigs, better pork, better profits. Janetta pork, better pigs, better pork, better profits. Janetta pork, one of dozens of companies now creating the food that you eat. Every woman in this room should think deeply about the frightening fact of animal reproduction. Because many feminists throughout history, from Annie Besson and Susan B. Anthony to Alice Walker and Gloria Steinem, became animal rights humanitarians. Because these great women not only understood that animals had an inherent right to be free, but these great women understood that their non-human sisters were being exploited for their reproductive organs. The female animal is viewed as nothing more than a baby machine by the greedy, callous malefactors who run the animal flesh industry. L.J. Taylor of Walls Meat Limited once said this in a National Hog Farmer magazine. I'm sure everybody has read their latest edition of National Hog Farmer. The breeding sow should be thought of and treated as a valuable piece of machinery whose function is to pump out baby pigs in a sausage machine. Last year in the U.S. alone, 17 billion fish, shrimp, lobsters, and other aquatic animals were killed and eaten. Many were raised on fish farms where they were genetically engineered. Yes, fish farms, farming is not just relegated to the land anymore. L.A. Times, one of its 2002 editions. Aqua Bounty Farms, one of dozens of companies now creating fish, genetically engineering them. If you look at the photo in the upper left, you'll notice that they have genetically altered a salmon to be twice as big as its wild counterpart. 
The rest of the aquatic animals were either hooked by the mouth or netted in huge trawlers, gigantic high-powered vacuum cleaners that suck up, catch, and kill everything in its path. In order to explain why fishing is cruel, vicious, and unethical, I decided to use an analogy today to help you empathize. Imagine reaching for an apple on a tree and having your hand suddenly impaled by a metal hook that drags you the whole weight of your body pulling on that one hand, dragging you out of the air and into an atmosphere in which you cannot breathe. That is what aquatic animals experience when they are removed from their watery habitat. Now, in addition to the ethical reasons that I just talked about, there are a few other reasons to remove animal flesh from your diet and embrace veganism. One is the fact that humans are not carnivores. The others are health and the environment. Any properly educated medical person can attest to the fact that human beings are not carnivorous creatures. In fact, Dr. William Roberts, editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Cardiology, a non-animal rights publication, in case you think his comments are biased, Dr. Roberts states quite simply, Human beings are not natural carnivores. When we kill animals to eat them, they end up killing us because their flesh, which contains cholesterol and saturated fat, was never intended for human beings who are natural herbivores. Let's compare the bodies of humans and other herbivores to lions and other carnivores. And yes, you can include omnivores in the carnivore category. All omnivores are carnivores. The intestines of humans and other herbivores are somewhere between 8 and 13 times their body's length. The length of the intestines on lions, other carnivores, and omnivores are somewhere between 3 and 6 times their body's length. The short length of the intestines on lions, other carnivores, and omnivores allows for decaying, rotting animal flesh, cholesterol, saturated fat, and animal protein to pass through quickly, which is why it is impossible, impossible for any lion for any carnivore or for any omnivore to ever, under any circumstance, get clogged arteries causing heart diseases. Nor do they acquire most cancers. Dr. William Costelli, by the way, who chairs the nutrition department at Harvard Medical School, contends that the human cancer rate would drop by 60% if we stopped eating animal flesh and animal byproducts. Humans and other herbivores have long and complex colons, while the colons of lions, other carnivores, and omnivores are short and simple. Humans and other herbivores have carbohydrate digestive enzymes in their saliva, while lions, carnivores, and omnivores lack carbohydrate digestive enzymes in their saliva. Human teeth are broad, short, blunted, flattened, and spade shaped. Broad, short, blunted, flattened, and spade shaped, like the teeth of other herbivores, not the fanged mouth of a lion, some other carnivore, or an omnivore. And yes, all herbivores have canines, incisors, and molars, so spare me that erroneous comment, it is not what kind of teeth you possess anyway, but the size and shape of the tooth that counts. If your jaw moves from side to side in a grinding motion, like ours do, then you are an herbivore. The jaws of carnivores and omnivores only move up and down, vertically. Then there's that thing that humans do with their meat before they eat it to make it edible. I believe it's called, um, what's it called again? Cooking? You know, funny how I flicked down National Geographic last week, but missed the episode of the Pride of Lions having a gazelle barbecue in the jungles of Tanzania. I always miss that episode. That's because lions, true carnivores, and omnivores eat raw bacteria-laden flesh. All kinds and all parts, not some kinds and some parts. We're talking all kinds and all parts, the eyes, the nose, the face, the toes, the tail, the anus, the inner organs, the blood, and the fur, every last delicious part. Humans have to cook certain parts of the dismembered animal to make it palatable so we don't become violently ill. We don't possess the stomach acid it takes to break down raw bacteria-laden flesh. And yeah, I know some Inuits, some Eskimos actually eat fish right out of the ocean. You'll notice they don't eat elk right off the bone. And I'm talking about some kinds and some parts or some extraordinary exception to the rule. We're talking all kinds and all parts. True carnivores eat all kinds and all parts. Let me make the carnivore challenge here today. If anybody wants to prove to me that you are a carnivore, it's simple. You take a little break, 
You can walk outside, find a dead squirrel, a raccoon, or an opossum, and bring it back and eat it. The entire animal, the eyes, the nose, the face, the toes, the tail, the anus, the inner organs, the blood, and the fur. Every last delicious part. That's all you have to do, and I will pack up my belongings and leave. You can laugh and giggle and mock everything I said here today. It's a simple challenge. As usual, nobody wants to take me up on that challenge. Now, if anyone still refuses to accept the fact that we are herbivores, let's check out this challenge by author Harvey Diamond. Put a two-year-old child in a crib with a bunny rabbit and an apple. And if that child eats the bunny rabbit and plays with the apple, I'll buy you a new car. Understand, humans have no carnivorous instincts whatsoever when we're born, when we're young, when we're growing up. We're all born vegan. We simply acquire a taste for animal flesh after it's forced down our throats in childhood. By the way, this nonsense about eating meat since the beginning of time, I guess it depends on which theory of time you believe in. So we'll take a few moments and talk about evolution and creation. If you believe in evolution, then humans are descendants of primates. And the last time I checked, primates were 99% herbivorous. Yeah, I know some primates eat termites. Others even engage in cannibalism like some humans do out of a territorial dispute. Because the worst insult you can levy against your enemy, not only will I conquer you, I will consume you. That's why I said 99% herbivorous. If human beings were 99% herbivorous, I would not be here today. Before the advent of tools and fire, we were vegan scavengers, no tools, no fire, then no meat, no hunter-gatherer, just gatherer. And if you believe in creation, via Judaism or Christianity, one should look no further than the Garden of Vegan. We do that all the time. I mean the Garden of Eden, a vegan haven, veganism reigns supreme there, Adam and Eve were the first vegans on this planet. No religious expert will dispute that fact. Isn't that incredibly illogical? Yet amazingly convenient that most people of faith believe that God and Jesus embrace the misery and murder of innocent animals. Yet those same people of faith also believe that God and Jesus are all compassionate, all loving, and all merciful, not violent, bloodthirsty, murderous devils. But you can't believe both of those scenarios. They contradict each other. The truth is, when you cause misery to animals and take part in their murder, you are causing God misery and murdering his soul. Civil rights activist, animal rights activist, humanitarian Alice Walker once eloquently summed up the reason for animal freedom. The animals of the world exist for their own reasons. They were not made for humans any more than black people were made for whites or women were created for men. Let's talk about the health reasons for veganism. Animal flesh and animal byproducts, such as milk, cheese, and gelatin, are not being consumed to maintain a healthy body. In fact, I can assure everyone in this room that a diet consisting of animal flesh and animal byproducts can, and in most cases will cause or contribute to heart disease, heart attacks, and strokes. Many cancers like prostate cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, kidney disease, diabetes, asthma, osteoporosis, and obesity, just to name a few. In the Detroit Free Press, one of its 2002 editions, child obesity illnesses rise. I'll bet my life those aren't vegan children. Dr. T. Colin Campbell of Cornell, Dr. William Costelli of Harvard, Dr. Dean Ornish of the University of California in San Francisco will all attest to the medical fact that eating animal flesh and byproducts are detrimental to your health. And that a well-planned vegan diet in and of itself is a preventative medicine. Dean Ornish, by the way, is considered such an expert on nutrition. Did you know that if you have heart disease, all the big insurance companies will actually pay for you to send you on a two-week retreat to learn about and learn how to follow Dean Ornish's vegan diet program. And just to be clear, it's not just cholesterol and saturated fat that cause illnesses. Animal protein is a main contributor as well. And I'm still looking for the first medical report in history that can indict broccoli or bananas as a cause of illness. Let me also mention this disgusting and disturbing truth about pathogen contamination in flesh food. During the killing process, when animals are hoisted in shackles 
and hanged upside down, sliced open and cut into pieces, I hope you realize that remnants of fecal matter, once on the inside of the body, end up on the outside of the body, oozing out onto the dismembered pieces of flesh. And unless you're vegetarian, that feces bacteria ends up in your mouth. Because even if you cook meat at the required temperature, cooking doesn't necessarily kill all the feces bacteria. Even if you wash meat thoroughly, whether at the slaughterhouse in huge vats of boiling water, or in your kitchen sink under the faucet, do you really want to eat something that was not only walking around and living in feces and urine on the factory farm, that was probably covered in feces when they were being dismembered at the slaughterhouse? Basically, the animals that most people eat have been marinating in feces and urine. Just to be clear, free-range animals are no cleaner than factory farm ones because all animals are dismembered in the same way. Everybody read A System for Assuring Poor Quality, right? Pig Slaughterhouse Guideline Book. You flip through and go to the feed withdrawal section. Numerous studies have shown the positive effects of withdrawing feed from market hogs for 12 to 18 hours prior to slaughter. These positive effects include less contamination during evisceration and less waste for the plant to handle. On a more palatable topic, with the ever-reliable tofu and the advent of fake meats like fake chicken, fake turkey, fake bacon, fake ham, fake sausage, fake ribs, fake tuna, veggie burgers, Veggie dog, soy milk, rice milk, soy cheese, all made from soybeans, wheat gluten, tempeh, seitan, or some other earth-friendly ingredient. Veganism has never been easier. Hey, 2,600 years ago when Pythagoras was vegan, it was tough. You were just eating fruits and vegetables. But nowadays, with all the fake meat products, you can have the same smell, taste, and texture of animal flesh without the flesh. No one has to suffer and die for your dinner anymore. Everyone in this room, eats meat or ate meat for one reason and one reason alone. Tasted good. I ate meat for 25 years because it tasted good. I love the way meat tastes. That's why I eat fake meat like it's going on a stock. Most grocery stores nowadays now carry all the veggie fake meat products. Don't forget about ethnic restaurants, Indian food, Middle Eastern food, Ethiopian food, tons of veggie options. Italian food, pasta and spaghetti, Thai food, Chinese food, Japanese food. Just take the meat out and put the tofu in. And if anyone thinks that tofu or soy chicken or tempeh burgers is gross, by the way, these products not made of flesh and vein and muscles and tendons, if you think that's gross, I wonder why meat, which is flesh and blood, and veins and muscles and tendons doesn't qualify as insanely gross to you. I can assure you, vegans are not eating the disgusting food products out there. And hey, not all vegan food tastes great. There's bad tofu and nasty veggie burgers, just like there's bad hamburgers and nasty steaks. Tofu can be cooked in many different ways. Dozens of companies make different tasting veggie burgers. Find the products you like and cook it the way you want and eat that. The last reason to remove animal flesh from your diet, go vegan, is the environmental destruction of animal-based agriculture. I hope you realize that it is impossible, impossible to be an environmentalist without being vegan. 50% of all the water used in the U.S. is wasted on factory farms. Our topsoil is being eroded from all the insecticides and pesticides sprayed on the animals that people eat to keep flies and mosquitoes off of them. What about all the water contamination from all the manure of all the animals raised and killed for food? The Sierra Club, non-animal rights group, the Sierra Club reported last year that factory farmed animals produced 2.7 trillion pounds of manure, with much of that manure ending up in rivers and lakes. But you'll be happy to know not all of that manure ends up in our waterways. The pig industry sells some of its manure to the chicken industry, and the chicken industry sells some of its manure to the cow industry, and so on. And that manure is mixed in with the corn and wheat into the feed to save money on the feed expense. Speaking of corn and wheat, 80% of the corn and 90% of the wheat grown in the U.S. 
is fed back to the animals and most people eat instead of feeding every starving person not only in the U.S., but abroad. Go buy the book's Diet for a New America or The Food Revolution, both by John Robbins for an amazing comprehensive look at veganism. And John Robbins happens to be quite a remarkable individual. You might recognize him by his last name if you think about it long enough. His family owns the billion-dollar Baskin-Robbins ice cream empire. However, about 20 years ago, John Robbins removed himself from the family business because he wanted no part of an industry that exploited and murdered cows, and no part of an industry that made people ill by feeding them animal secretions. Cow's milk is a secretion, and secretions are filled with delicious fluids like pus and mucus. And I hope you realize that when a dairy cow can no longer give quality milk or produce huge amounts of milk, she's sent to the slaughterhouse and killed. There are no cow sanctuaries in the dairy industry. In fact, when it comes to pain and suffering, the dairy cow just might suffer more than any enslaved animal on this planet. Chino, California, for instance. They have the largest concentration of dairy farms on this planet. More than 350,000 cows live there. Kept alive for three to seven years, machines hooked up to their udders for several hours a day, sucking milk out with hormones and antibiotics forced into their bodies to make them produce tremendous amounts of milk until they can no longer produce tremendous amounts of milk. You know, the dairy industry has done a masterful job at convincing everyone that cows naturally give milk. I hope you don't believe that. Cows are like any other female animal. They can only give milk during and after pregnancy. So once a year, dairy cows are artificially impregnated to keep the milk flow going. And within two days of giving birth, within two days, their babies are taken away from them, which is outright cruelty in and of itself. Their babies are stolen from them at birth. Most of the male babies sent off to veal farms put in crates so tiny. They're never allowed to stand up. Ropes and chains put around their necks to completely immobilize them and prevent any muscle development whatsoever, which is why veal flesh is tender, no muscle development. As for the females, most of the females, kept on the dairy farm, enslaved like their mothers. They will be turned into dairy cows as well. The rest of the females and some of the males sold to the beef industry where they will be killed at nine months of age for their flesh. Dairy products contribute to the same ailments as animal flesh. Most allergies, obesity, and ear infections in children stem from dairy consumption. Many cancers have been linked as well. Dr. Frank Oski, once the head pediatrician at Johns Hopkins University wrote a book called Don't Drink Your Milk for a Reason. Dr. Benjamin Spock, who passed away in the late 90s, in his late 90s, and was the world's foremost pediatrician, also condemned the consumption of cow's milk. He also preached vegan diets as well in the last printed edition of Baby and Child Care. I guess everybody skipped over that vegan chapter, though. Oh, yeah, and this just did. Cow's milk is made for a baby cow or a baby bull. Not a baby human, not a young human, and not an adult human. Cows make milk for their babies. The human body has no need for cow's milk like it has no need for dog milk or giraffe milk or zebra milk or rhinoceros milk. And if you think that milk builds strong bones and does a body good, clever propaganda, great advertising from the dairy industry, if that were the case, then how come Americans who consume the most cow's milk in the civilized world rank 18th in preventing osteoporosis and bone fractures, while Vietnamese, who are 100% lactose intolerant, have the lowest virtually non-existent rates of osteoporosis and extremely low rates of bone fractures as well? And Asians, who are for the most part lactose intolerant, have extremely low rates of osteoporosis and bone fractures. That's because... The especially acidic protein found in cow's milk, I repeat, the especially acidic protein found in cow's milk and other animal foods for that matter, actually causes our kidneys to excrete calcium. So basically, when you drink a glass of cow's milk, you're peeing most of that calcium in cow's milk right down the toilet. Cow's milk is a poor source of calcium for your body. Nutrition expert Ruth Heydrich will attest to this fact. And she will also contend that exercise builds strong bones, just like exercise builds strong muscles. 
She also refers to a bone density study done on tennis players. And she notes that even though both arms and the tennis player receive the same amount of calcium, the bone density in a tennis player's serving arm is 35% thicker than the bone density in the non-serving arm. So where can you get the calcium you need to maintain a healthy body? Plants. Green leafy vegetables like broccoli and kale have calcium. Soybeans have calcium. So eat tofu and drink soy milk. Rice milk has been fortified with calcium. Heck, nowadays even orange juice has been fortified with calcium. Plant-based calcium with lots of exercise builds strong bones and does a body good. If you're still consuming a beverage that once oozed out of animal udders, you might want to reconsider your diet and go vegan. Because animal secretions filled with extracts of pus don't belong in your body. One last thought, then we'll do a Q&A session. To prove once again that human beings are completely herbivorous creatures, think about this. Each society justifies eating certain animals because they've acquired a taste for some and an aversion to others. So if humans ever got together globally in world peace, sat down to the table of brotherhood and sisterhood, I hope you realize during the unification celebration dinner, a vegan meal would have to be served. Why? At this table of peace, Americans would say, hey, we're not eating dogs, cats, and horses. Even though dogs and cats are consumed in Asian nations and horses are eaten throughout Europe, Muslims and Orthodox Jews would say, hey, we're not eating pig flesh. Don't feed us pig flesh. Indians would not eat cows because cows are sacred animals in India. The cow in India is akin to the dog in America. Seventh-day Adventists, Hindus, Buddhists, and the ultra-Buddhist Jains would take out the chickens, the turkeys, the other so-called food animals, and the byproducts because they're vegetarians and vegans by religion. The first precept of Buddhism, by the way, not the second, third, fourth, or fifth, the first precept states, you must refrain from harming and killing living creatures. The many atheist vegans of the world will take out any other creature or byproduct that you can think of, and the only thing left to eat that everybody could agree upon would be stir-fried tofu. Stir-fried tofu or some other vegan meal. Thank you very much for listening. You said that there was pus in milk. How does it get there? Well, because pus is a secretion, and when you're taking something out of an animal, other things come out with it. So when you're taking milk out, not only does pus come out, but mucus comes out as well. Once again, all fluids are connected inside. You can't just take certain fluids. So they all come out. How are we supposed to find a cure for cancer if we don't use animals? Well, first of all, we have to understand that animal research is unscientific because of the anatomical, the physiological, the immunological, and the histological dealing with cell structures. All those differences make animal research unscientific, and animal-derived data can never be made relevant to another species. One of my mentors in the movement, many people don't know, is Don Barnes. He used to work for the National Anti-Vivisection Society. Of all the scientific things that Don Barnes told me, he's a former animal researcher, by the way, he said, Gary, I tortured chimpanzees for 15 years for the military. I tortured them. I worked on their brains. I know a heck of a lot about chimpanzee brains, but I have no idea how to make it relevant to a human brain. We need to use true scientific techniques like human-based tissue and cell cultures using in vitro, mathematical models, computer models using virtual reality and 3D programs, epidemiological studies, uh, human-based clinical research, Molecular biology, cellular biology, that's true science. Okay, we don't learn anything by torturing on a monkey, a cow, a pig, or a dog. It has no relevance to your mother's health, to your daughter's health, to your brother's health, to your niece or your nephew. Let's not forget that George Bernard Shaw once said that those who won't hesitate to vivisect won't hesitate to lie about it as well. Now, how did you get into animal rights issues? Many people would be shocked to know that my stepfather is a clown in the Shrine Circus. And in my early 20s, true story, he brought me backstage to the circus. He said, hey, Gary, you want to see the elephants and the lions and the tigers? You like the animals? Come on. I'm like, yeah, great. And I went back there in Michigan, the Michigan State Fairgrounds, on 8 Mile and Woodward Avenue. I'll never forget this day. And I walked back there, and I walked up face-to-face -face with an 8,000-pound elephant. 
Her front left leg was chained up. Her back right leg was chained up. She was swaying neurotically back and forth, which is the neurotic behavior that elephants in the circus get for being confined and completely immobilized because they're all kept in chains backstage. I looked into her eyes and I saw nothing but hopelessness, sadness, and fear. And common sense told me that this was unjust. I looked to the left, there was a tiger pacing in a cage. I looked to the right, there was a monkey screaming and holding on to the bars. And it completely blew my mind. It hit me like a ton of bricks. And I wanted to know what else was going on animals from there. I left that day. I did go back out for the rest of the show briefly until the yellow, until the bears came out wearing yellow tutus, riding tricycles. So I left, and I wanted to know where my food came from, where my clothes came from, what really went on in Metal Caloosage. And I called every animal rights organization I could think of. I got literature, I got videos, and I eventually became a vegan and an advocate for animal rights and a speaker. So that's how I got started. <laughs> Thank you.